My name is Kate Holden and I'll be conducting an In Conversation today with Sonia Falero and uh, this event is supported by the Australia India Council. So um, we're very lucky to have Sonia visiting Australia and here to talk with us today. Uh, so, Sonia, welcome to the Sydney Writers' Thank Festival you so much. in Australia. It's wonderful to have you here. Sonia is an award-winning journalist and writer of books, born in India, educated in Edinburgh. That's right. And um, now living in the States. Her first book was a novel, The Girl. Um, and the new one, Beautiful Thing, which we're going to be discussing today, um, is her second and a work of narrative non-fiction. It's had rave reviews and was named Time Out Subcontinental Book of the Year. Sonia's work has, for a very long time, focused on the marginalised and poor of India, especially on the lives of women, such as domestic workers and people in the sex industry, as well as re having written for India Today and uh, Vogue India, which you're a contributing editor to. She has contributed to several anthologies with the Guardian newspaper calling one of her essays Urgent and Stark. It took her five years to research and write Beautiful Thing, um, and it shows it's a very accomplished book. I first read this book when I was sent it by her Australian publisher, Black Ink, for an endorsement on the cover, what we call a puff. Um, sometimes I get asked to do puffs, and it's a bit of a labour because you have to read a whole book in order to provide a sentence for free to someone who's probably not even your publisher, and you might only bump into it at a cocktail party at the Sydney Writers' Festival. Um, so sometimes these things are done for the kind of brownie points or... Um, sometimes even just to get your name on the front cover of someone else's book. But in this case, I did it for sheer enthusiasm. It was a real honour to read Sonia's book. I read it in galleys, which is not the most ideal way to read a book. It's huge, you know, pages, A3 pages, and you have to sit there and drop them on the floor next to you, and the cat gets in and, you know, and tries to play <laughs> with them. And it's a difficult way to read a book, but I could not put this one down. I read it in two sittings, and I was completely haunted by it when I wasn't you know, reading the book. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And as soon as I finished, I went off and told everyone I know that they should read it. Um, it's a, an extraordinary book. It's uh, tremendously sad uh, and yet extremely funny. It's a very funny book in places. It's vivid and full of scenes and characters as if in a novel. And yet it's about extremely real people in a very, very real and concrete <coughs> world. Um, it's shocking and disturbing, but also very human. Uh, in some ways, I think it conforms or it confirms some Western ideas about Indian poverty, um, specifically the poverty of Mumbai, which we'll call Bombay because it's referred to as Bombay in the book, um, as just a, a very desperate and a hostile environment for very many poor people. Um, but it also presents a Bombay which is in some ways way beyond slumdog millionaire uh, and a Bombay which comes to life with um, diamante encrusted mobile phones and a mother who just lounges around watching daytime soaps all day mm. and, um, and Leela, who is the central character, who is absolutely unforgettable. Uh, so, Sonia, I thought I would just ask you to do the hard work and just begin by describing <laughs> what is the book about. Could you just tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Um, so, Beautiful Thing is a work of narrative nonfiction, and it follows this absolutely amazing, courageous, vibrant young woman called Leela, who was 19 when I met her in 2005. Now, the reason I wanted to get to know Leela was because I'd heard about dance bars. They'd been around in Bombay since the 1970s. But there wasn't much reportage about them uh, for the specific reason that they'd been around and they were part of the fabric of, you know, everyday life. One always passed a dance bar on a corner street but didn't really know what was happening inside. But I understood that they were a vibrant subculture of Bombay, which in itself is just a very fascinating and, you know, eye-popping sort of place. And I can say mm -hmm. that even having lived there for seven years, it still constantly surprises and shocks me in ways that are good and bad. But you have these dance bars, which are essentially tiny little clubs, you know, and, and men, uh, say, of a lower socioeconomic group will go there to watch women dance. And these women are fully clothed. They wear saris or salwar kameezes. They stand on a platform. And the men stand at a distance of about, sit at a distance of about 10 to 15 feet and throw money at these girls who are dancing to Bollywood music. So there is no interaction between the dancers and the men. It's just appreciation. It's sort of, you know, trying to replicate the old Nawabi Mughal culture in, in a completely different way. But yet it's just a high energy, an intoxicating sort of place, just like a club is, you know, with a lot of sexual tension. And the dance bar itself has uh, its own rules, its own twist and language, its own hierarchy. Yes. And so I remember catching a news report on dance bars and just thinking, hey, this might be an interesting subject to pursue. 
And so I asked one of my sources in the bar and brothel business, if one he would, of your in one of my sources, <laughs> <laughs> if he would introduce me to the to a few bar dancers. And he said, well, fine, but, you know, these girls never talk. Mm-hmm. And if they talk, they tell lies. Mm-hmm. Uh, but <laughs> if you want to, I'll, I'll return the favor that you've done for me. I don't recall what. Uh, so he invited me to his dance bar. And uh, note that none of the girls he'd called were, worked for him. So oh, okay. he'd, he'd locked up his girls somewhere. He'd call these girls from elsewhere. And Leela was one of them. And she, was, she owned the room. You know, she was so flirtatious with everybody, uh, the stewards, the, the waiter who gave us our drinks with me. And what was so captivating about her was the effervescence, her beauty and youth, and seeing this beauty and youth in uh, an effervescence in context of my knowledge that bar dancers, almost without exception, have suffered violent abuse, all of them have uh, sought the dance bar as a refuge from incredibly different, difficult lives, usually involving sexual abuse, uh, perhaps incest, all sorts of violence. Mm. And uh, so I, I, I think I was struck by that dichotomy, and I decided to start um, following Leela around. Just as one of, you know, as a reporter, I would tail people and, uh, until they swatted me away and told me to get a life of my own. And she sounds like someone who might not have minded the attention. No, actually she didn't. Um, look, you know, when you interview people from marginalised communities, it's important to remember that they, they have nothing to gain mm-hmm. from talking to me. You know, it doesn't, in fact, because they are generally involved in uh, illegal or perceived illegal professions, it's harmful for them to talk to me oh, or yes. even to be seen talking to me because that yes. might... Uh, create a backlash from their own community, which is often very insular, for obvious reasons. Um, So it's hard to get them to open up. Um, And because of the various brutalities they've suffered, they don't trust people. And so then it is true that often people like this, when they talk to you, they will lie. Mm -hmm. And again, it's something that you need to accept and understand for what it is. And you need patience. But I think, yes, she was... um, because I was persistent, she perhaps threw her hands up and said, all right, fine. Okay, fine. You know? And she gave you really quite amazing access to her life, didn't she? She did. Um, I think because she invested her trust in me, so did her core group of family and friends. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when people say, well, wasn't it unsafe going to the red light area or going to these dance bars in the middle of the night? It was, but I also had the security of her, I suppose you could call it friendship. Yes, yes. I really want to get into this whole thing with her family and the access and also, yes, the, the kind of context that these women are, are working in and where they've come from. But um, before we get into that, because I'm a writer, I'm quite curious about the way you, you created this book. Um, it's it's labelled as narrative non-fiction, which is a genre which is extremely popular these days and really developing in uh, some extraordinary ways, very vibrant and dynamic ways. And writer, uh, readers are often attracted to them because they combine a lot of the, the privileges of fiction in some ways, uh, you know, immediate dialogue and scene setting, the, that kind of fictional narratology with uh, factual material, so it feels sincere and authentic. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk a bit about how you've come to write in that genre, in narrative non-fiction, and what you think it means. Well, India doesn't have a tradition of narrative non-fiction, so, um, you know, when I started writing Beautiful Thing, when I was conceptualizing it, I was pretty sure nobody would read it. And yes. it, that was comforting, because if no one is going to read your book, then you can really take as much time as you it's want. You can <laughs> linger on it forever, and I did linger yes. for several years. Yes. Uh, look, the reason I chose narrative nonfiction is because, um, you know, 55% of our population is poor. You know, eight states in India are poorer than the 26th poorest nations mm-hmm. in Africa. So we, we live with poverty. We live with the, the sight of poverty. You know, there is no place in India that you can go to where you can cocoon yourself from the tragedy of that daily deprivation. But because it's a daily sighting, I think people protect themselves from it by seizing after a point to see it. Mm. And then when you don't see it, when it's not part of your conversation, as a reporter or a writer, you don't write about it because Mm. it doesn't exist for you anymore. So your eyes gloss over these images and what you see instead are the success stories and, you know, I'm sorry, the call centers and the, you know, the economic boom, all of which we are very proud of and, you know, very valid stories to be talked about. But I felt that there, there had to be a way to talk about something that is, at the same time, 
every day and at the same time absolutely not mm. ordinary and every day mm. i mean because a lot of sorry just to interrupt mm. but a lot of the indian literature that the people in australia are familiar with is um fabulous literature you know salman rushdie and people like him who write a kind of an extravagant version of of mm. india which is very far mm. removed it might have in, in you know, incorporated aspects of poverty in real life, but it's very kind of elaborated and, and baroque almost. Um, and yet your book is extremely concrete. You know, I, I respect that sort of writing, and it's certainly it's valid for them and for people who read that. But that's not the world that I see. Mm-hmm. And what narrative nonfiction does is it allows me to understand the society that can create somebody like me and that can create somebody like Leela almost, well, in unequal measures, Mm. and express it in a way that um, elicits the sort of response that I had, you know, very immediate, very visceral, sort of, well, I don't want to say the book is unforgettable, but certainly my experiences were unforgettable. And I wanted to find a way to tell that story without making it dull. Yes. You know? (laughs) Yes, well, it's not dull, but I mean, you had a lot of experience in writing about kind of um, the dispossessed in India. I mean, you've been you've made a career out of looking at a lot of different aspects of that kind of life. What what were you expecting to find in the in the bars? Do you think, or, or what draw, drew you there, um, and and how were your expectations changed or, or confirmed? Uh, yes, I was writing about marginalised communities for several years. But what happened with Leela was that, you know, a few months after I met her, the state government of Maharashtra, of which Bombay is the capital, decided that bar dancers were immoral, that their dancing fully clothed on a stage was somehow contributing to the fall in the morality levels of the youth. And it was connected to the underworld, and it was connected to corruption, in ridiculous little theories that were thrown out. And within three or four months of that, these declarations, the government shut down dance bars. Mm-hmm. So Leela and about 70 or 75,000 girls like her were forced onto the streets. And I can say that with a certain sense of surety because these girls came from castes that were traditionally depressed and they did not have an education. They had no skills. So, of course, they're going to do what makes them the quickest money. Yes. Uh, and so they ended up, the many, many of them ended up in various forms of sex work. And, you know, there's a whole hierarchy of sex work and sex workers in Bombay yes, yes. that's fairly distinct to the city. Um, So despite having studied this and having written about uh, matters like this uh, in in few years preceding, the descent from that sort of successful life that she had to the the brutality of where she was dragged down to, was it was so immediate and so absolute that I really, I couldn't believe it. And again, you know, just to reiterate, in Bombay you see this all the time, and yet having seen it, for me to feel like, I really couldn't sleep at night. It was, I, I felt that there, was, there had to be a way to chronicle this. Because uh, I, I think because of Leela's gender and because of her class, um, this was something that she expected. And it was something that was almost taken for granted, that she would be marginalized. And I think we do it repeatedly. Uh, and I just didn't want us, I didn't want to forget. Oh. So it's a tribute, you know, in a way. There's a, there's a line that Leela says towards the end of the book I was just reading. She says something about destiny is stronger than iron, it's tougher than steel. And she says, I always felt this was my destiny to, you know, to end up where she is. Well, and that, at the very end of the book, I won't spoil what happens, but, you know, things are actually have taken a rather surprising turn at the end. Um, but she, she's a, an extraordinary character because she very much exemplifies the, the downward pressures of the cultural and, and societal you know, system that she's in, that there, she comes from a, you know, a, a fairly poor family, she's abused in several ways by her father, and then she ends up taking kind of sanctuary in the bars. And then, yet again, circumstances completely out of her control determine her destiny for her, and yet she is this irrepressible person. Mm. She's completely indomitable, even when she's absolutely degraded in some ways, but she's just got this incredible spirit. Um, I, I, I'd like to actually be uh, just backtrack a little bit before we get into the fabulous Leela, but I think I should explain to the audience that one of the great delights about this book is the reportage element, and a lot of that is the, the dialogue. The dialogue is absolutely um, insistent. It got into my head. I went around speaking Leela speak for days afterwards or, you know, trying to. Um, and 
I was looking for a passage in the book that would really encapsulate the way, especially the, the women, there are three main fa- female characters, Leela, her mother, Apsara, and her friend Priya, that they have these fantastic conversations. Their conversations were a little bit long to read, but I thought I'd get um, Sonia to just read a little bit of dialogue from between herself and Abid Khan, who's a gentleman who features in the book. So if you wouldn't mind reading that sure. passage. Do you visit dance bars? I asked, watching Leela's retreating back. Abid Khan sat up. Barwalis are devil women, I tell you, he said vigorously. It's true what they say. If you visit a lady's bar, you'll be ruined. How so? Are you go there for some fun. Am I right? You have drinks, you become high. You become high, you become horony. Horony? Yes, wanting sex, horony. You don't know Horoni? Um, yes? Yes, you know Horoni? Are What Horoni, Horoni? Grumbled Musti. Leave her alone. Are you yourself Horoni, the way you are looking, talking, making eyes at her? No, sweetie, nothing like that. I'm just explaining. See, you become high, you become Horoni. Am I right? You become Horoni, you want sex. You want sex, you need a girl. But these bar dancers, oh, let me tell you, they are not of flesh and blood. They are entirely of nakra. In a certain kind of bar, one of them will sit next to you and she will say, Hello, handsome. Can I use your cell? Or, Hey, sweetie, how are you? And naturals, you get excited. But the moment you say, Hello, beautiful, want to come to a hotel with me? She will start to make all sorts of sounds and faces like she's a movie star and you're asking for an autograph in the middle of her eating time. And her starting rate is so high, and Ambani only can fuck her. How much would a girl like that ask for? Any amount that enters her head? Sometimes 4,000 rupees, sometimes five. And that doesn't include the fee for the lodge and for all the food she'll make you buy her. Like she's a half-starved goat. (laughs) And not only is she overpriced, she's much too sharp. Sharp as a drawer full of knives. (laughs) I tell you sometimes, I feel sorry for these girls. But then one of them plays me for a fool, and I realize, Gaib hans pani mein, the buffalo has gone into the water. There's nothing I can do for her. She's a hopeless case. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I've got to just ask, how did you get that kind of dialogue on the page? I'm so envious of your ability to do it. Um, can I ask how, I mean, how were you relating to the people when you were having these conversations? Did you have a little recorder, were you taping mental notes? Was it just simply the flavour of the, of the experience that stayed with you? Well, you know, I speak Hindi fluently. So um, I didn't imagine that it would be a problem. Uh, but it was, because, like I said, they had their own twist and language. They this fantastic patois. They use things. They say, <laughs> don't take tension. All I the love time. that. Um, and, you know, I, I, I really some really salty language that would make my eyes water and my ears turn red. <laughs> but I think after a while, well, I used to do a lot, a lot of recordings. I take a lot of notes. And after a while, you just get into the swing of things because mm. the language has a marvelous rhythm to it. Mm. Um, and really, it speaks to their experience and to the life that they have. So it's important. It was important for me to put that on page. Um, it almost felt like if I didn't, it would just make them regular. And, and they weren't for me. No, they, I mean, they, they, it's kind of aspirational language in some ways, isn't it? Because, for some example, someone who's very kind of classy looking is hi-fi. Yeah. And um, they're always kind of trying to, not trying to, but they're also kind of appropriating all these terms and then knitting it into their own dialect and their own set of kind of significance, which is part of the story. Um, uh, I mean, Leela is not poor a lot of the time. I mean, she makes all this money. She's, and then because it's strange because she comes from a poor background and she's, her life is so precarious, but then she, she just has money and she, um, she has thousands of clothes. She has a, t- a wardrobe full of T-shirts and little phones and she's this kind of beautiful gazelle. With, I can imagine her with her long legs and her high heels. She has all these kind of swains, these desperately infatuated men, and she rings them up and demands that they bring her... Um, take away food, and then she just leaves it in the fridge and it just all rots, you know. And vegetables. And vegetables. She's just a mania for collecting vegetables. And and at the same time, she's got this great great sense of humour and she is just such a character, but she's also tremendously vulnerable in ways. And um, at one point she says, um, you know, she talks about being an alone girl. Um, She says, "People people will take advantage of an alone girl. 
Um, and yet she, she sometimes makes herself lonely. I guess this is one of the paradoxes of that life, is that she has to um, rely on other people to support her in lots of ways. She has this coterie of male followers. She has a, a husband, um, P. Shetty, uh, and she has uh, f- uh, female friends, but at the same time she has to constantly make sure that everyone understands who she is and she has to be harsh on other women that she works with and, and isolate herself from them so she's always maintaining her spot. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, the female competition in, in the book because it's an extremely dynamic competitive world between the women with the, within and beyond the hierarchies that exist in the sex industry. Yeah. Well, you know, there are uh, communities um, in India that, um, that encourage... Uh, actually the real world would be force their children or at least one of the girl child into the entertainment profession. Okay, so you have uh, cast, for example, like the Nut or the Kalbelia that uh, uh, let their children into theater or street performance. So from the age of, say, three, uh, a child will start performing on the trapeze. Okay, on the street and earning money. And the child will perform on that trapeze until she is about 13 years old. And then she's considered too old. She's not going to attract any, uh, she's not going to attract an audience because she's too big. And so then she is taken off that trapeze and then she has to marry and bear children. And then that child, again, when the child is three years old, starts. So then, you know, in these communities, one of the girls will enter the street performance, uh, dancing, then, you know, and, and these are all in, in some way or the other loosely connected to sex work, or they will go into straight up sex work. But there is a sense of the woman, of the girl, from a very young age as being the provider. You know, she mm. supports the family, and while she supports the family, the rest of the family essentially just sits around. So you, you can visit these little villages, and you will see the, in the house there are grown men and women just sitting around doing nothing, there's just a, chatting. There's a scene where her brothers ring her up and, and, and comfort her and say, go and buy yourself a little treat, as if they're paying for it, but it's her Absolutely. money oh, it's, that she's been sending back to them. Absolutely. They're so, you know, these women, they understand that they are the bread earners, they realize that it gives them a measure of power uh, and a measure of control, mm-hmm. and that is their security. Um, and so they don't end up competing with other men, they end up competing with other women, and they're all competing for the same thing. It's ironic because they're essentially competing to support their families, the families that are constantly extracting money from them, abusing mm-hmm. them. And when they are older, for example, when a bar dancer uh, Uh, gets ready to retire, which might be in her 30s or maximum early 40s, often she can't go back to the village she came from because she's, uh, you know, considered a sex worker. So the same family who had benefited from her for decades will will not permit her to return because they'll say, well, you know, I'm sorry, you're a blight in our name and this is getting embarrassing. (laughs) Because she can't earn money, so she's no longer useful. I mean, and the women are also competitive in other realms as well. Um, I mean, Priya has a very complicated love life, um, and then she comes up against Barbie, another woman who was after the same. It doesn't look like Barbie at all. Uh, and I mean, it's it's quite a you know, it's kind of funny, but it's also quite horrific because Priya and Barbie confront each other and. Both women cut themselves. She say that cutting is extremely common in this world, and um, and Barbie kind of out wins the wins the confrontation by proving that she's sliced up her own breast out of such kind of um, extravagant devotion to the man that she this is the the most extreme thing she could do to prove that she loves him more than Priya does, and so she wins the contest hands down because Priya can't, you know even she's flabbergasted by this. But, um, I mean, they have a very brutal kind of uh, relationship sometimes. There's quite a lot of violence in, in this world. Um, yeah. And I'd like to speak about um, Apsara, Leela's mother, because she is such a strong relationship in the, in the book, and she embodies many of the most irritating things about mothers. Um, and, uh, and, and, she, and yet she's kind of adorable in a horrific kind of a way. Right, um, like a gargoyle. Like yes, that. yes. Um, and, and your description of you encountering her is, is hilarious. Um, but Apsara has a very... Um, kind of, she has quite a journey herself in the book. I was wondering if you could just read a little bit about, sure. um, about the fact that there, there's a an observation in the book that for Apsara's pain as a wife who's beaten, for her pain in life to end, um, her daughter Leela's pain has to begin. And it's almost a transfer of the, of mm-hmm. the responsibility. 
Um, and I was wondering if you could just read this passage about Leela and her mother. Leela looked at her mother thoughtfully. Since I could see, I saw my father beating my mother. I didn't know ABC, but I knew what it meant when Manohar threw aside his plate. That's why I ran away, because he abused her. Once he hit her so hard, she fainted. And because she didn't say no, he abused me. And I knew that if I stayed on, if I didn't say no, one day he would do the same to my children. Now I see her sons have inherited this quality from their father. They think women were created by God to serve men like them. And that's what makes me so angry. That she can see what they think of her. She can see it because I can see it and neither of us is blind. And yet she supports them. She loves them. She loves them more than she loves me. But why? Why when I'm the successful one, the one who works, who feeds her, who clothes her, who asks if she has taken her medicine? Why when I'm the one who had the courage to leave for the city? When I'm the one who became a success and made money, makes money? Money like a man. No, no, more than a man. I'll tell you why. Because they're boys, and I'm a girl. Nothing but a girl. The value of a boy is twice that of a girl, isn't it so, mummy? Even if the boy is useless. Apsara's eyes welled. That's not true. Yes, yes it is. It's not true, Leela. Okay. I'm not strong like you. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've got to say, um, Apsara is a really fascinating character because she lives off her daughter in all these ways. She transfers her pain to her daughter and yet she professes always to love and cherish her. She loves nothing more than adoring her beautiful daughter and combing her hair and rubbing her feet and she kind of has this submissive attitude to her own daughter even as she's you know, got her fingers in it. And, and Apsara um, then later in the book becomes the madam of a brothel herself. Um, and there is this, this this thing which is kind of shocking to someone like me in Australia, where families are. I mean, it's almost like a family business, the sex industry. Uh, there's one really disturbing story that you tell about a, a woman who brings up her children, and then one night her son rapes her, um, and then pimps her out. Uh, he's the pimp, and it seems to be fairly common that there are sons who pimp their mothers. It's just part of the the industry. And Apsara is is involved in all of this and she becomes herself a kind of a brutal madam, but she has one of her girls recite her list of her virtues. You know, she makes us wash our bottom areas every night and, you know, we have to do this and we have to eat our wedge vegetables <laughs> and and so on. So she's benign but she's monstrous as well. I find her a, a, a frightening character. Uh, the other the other part of it, as you might be gathering, is that there are quite a lot of men in this book who don't come out looking too well. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think it's a book which is unnecessarily bagging on men, but there are very few male characters in the book, if, if any, who don't come across as kind of grotesquely insensitive to women in some way. They're very uh, adept at, at um, having relationships with women and using them and, and so on, and yet they have a, a strangely um, oblivious attitude to what's yeah. going on. You know, I, I think it's cultural, and... I do think that women in India don't have, um, they are not in a position to make the decisions that men can. I mean, time and again, in the course of my reportage, I'll see a man who's just, you know, thrown up his hands in the air and said, well, I can't carry on and, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. Uh, and, And sits back and does nothing but drink. Mm. You know, the woman doesn't have that option. Yeah. She can't throw up her hands because if she does that, she's going to get beaten and thrown out of her house and her family won't accept her back. And in any case, she has children to look after. You know, one of the times this really struck me in, in a very poignant fashion was when I was doing a piece of um, long reportage on HIV widows in Bombay. And there's this growing community of poor, young, poor widows with children. And, you know, I would talk to them about uh, how they got, how they think they acquired HIV, and, uh, you know, their case studies would show that they had been virgins before they married. After they married, uh, their husbands would continue visiting brothels, and it was just considered part of the relationship. The husband acquired HIV, passed it on to the wife, then denied having passed it on, blamed her, uh, tried to get her thrown out of the house, 
And then at some point she said, you know, this is all too much for me. Now I'm just going to eat and drink and wait for God to take me. Uh, and so not take me- medicines mm. and become an alcoholic and then swiftly pass on. And the woman, once she acquired HIV or full-blown AIDS, didn't have that option of throwing her hands up yes. in the air. And so you have this huge community of young widows. And so you see it in various pockets uh, of not just Bombay but elsewhere. The, I think the resilience that women have and the courage is just not seen in men. It's not even expected of them. No. And so I don't think, you know, I'm not, I'm not picking on men. I'm just presenting them as they appear to me. And again, I'm not saying that universally, you know, men in Bombay or in dance bars or in India, you know, um, are of a certain kind. But certainly it seems to me that the Indian woman is far out the backbone. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, the, well, the women in this book are, are quite amazing. I, I, I'm going to throw the questions in a, in a moment. But um, just on the subject of sex work, because this is something that I, I've been a sex worker here in, in Australia in a very different context. Um, I, I worked illegally on the street, which is a f- slightly dangerous environment. But um, And then I worked in, in legal brothels. So it's a very, very different context to what is going on in, in Bombay. And yet I think that there are some... We probably have to share some common attitudes. Um, I found a quote that you had um, made about the work that you um, did on, on sex work reportage. You said, sex work is work like any other. Um, sex workers are a, statis- a statistic dehumanised by social stigma and apathy. The greatest suffering I witnessed involved sex workers, but this is also true for the greatest joys. Um, I mean, sex work in itself is is a kind of a morally neutral thing in in my eyes. It so much depends on how it's managed and administered and who is doing what, who's brought to the industry in what ways. Um, It sounds like sex work in Bombay is very different to sex work in Australia. Would you like to speak a bit about how you see the sex industry? Sure. You know, there's a hierarchy. So you, at the very bottom, you'll have the girls or the hijras who are the transgender community in India who work in the brothels and completely under the thumb of the brothel madam cannot leave, have to pay off some imagined debt. Uh, then you have the, uh, the floating sex workers, as we call them. These are women who consider themselves too independent to work for a brothel madam. But, you know, when you work on the streets, and I'm sure this is true of everywhere, but in particular in Bombay, anybody can pick you up off the street. And because you're a sex worker, your body is considered public property. So, you know, I have met a sex worker who's... uh, uh, I've met a young woman, I'm sorry, whose sister was a sex worker and who, after having sex with a customer, had her nipples and tongue sliced off and was left to die on the bed. And it's almost an everyday occurrence for these women to get robbed and beaten. And there's absolutely no question of them going to the cops because the cops will say, well, you do it anyway. The only difference was he didn't pay you or he stole from you. You know, what's the big deal? Mm-hmm. Uh, then you have the call center girls, you know, and these are girls who claim to have fallen on hard times and who, um, well, you know, receive calls and they hang out by the pools of five-star hotels. And again, there's this desire to claim some sort of middle-class respectability to say, well, you know, it's just right now my father's lost his job. But you have this sense that really it's something that they've been forced to go into and that perhaps there is no way out for them. Mm. And the bar dancers were at the top of this, this, uh, this hierarchy because really while they performed sex work, while they had you know, sexual encounters in exchange for money and for the possibility of a relationship, it wasn't their primary source of income. Right. You know, they could, they just supplemented, some of them supplemented their income. And that's what makes this so tragic, is that you took somebody who had a legitimate job, was making good money, was extricating her family from poverty, mm-hmm. educating her younger siblings, and then just threw her out. Yes. Closed onto the, the streets. Well, I mean, uh, there's the... There's the fact that these women are trying so hard, and yet the very authorities who are closing the bars are, of course, themselves completely corrupt. Um, I mean, Leela's father sells her, or you know, sells her services to, as a 13-year-old girl to the, all the policemen at the local station to have sex with her. And then when they call her names and he calls her names, you know, he has like, there's no sympathy for her that she's been sold. You know, her her ac- access to her body has been sold to these men. So the the moral hypocrisy at work in that is breathtaking really 
um, and clearly had no effect on raising the moral standards of Bombay because there have been far more sex workers living in far more difficult circumstances and far more exposed to HIV and so on. Absolutely. It's just basically taken our already vulnerable group and made them even more vulnerable. Yes, that's right. I mean, in Australia it's a little bit different because there's very mobilised sex worker advocacy groups here and that while there is an illegal sex industry on the streets and so on, even that is is fairly out in the open in lots of ways and there's the, the police have a harm minimization attitude in often in many cases so things are you know the, and the more lifted up into kind of legislated light mm. the industry becomes the more safe it is for everyone in, involved the clients L and the and the ladies who work in it um, and the men but obviously in in Bombay it's gone the other way which is just terribly sad well you know activists do attempt to educate these young women to provide them with condoms. There are mobile yes, clinics exactly. set up in several neighborhoods. But sex work is still technically illegal, which means that you can, you can go around proclaiming yourself as a sex worker. Nobody can arrest you. But if the police can prove that you benefit economically from sex work, they can arrest you, which really logically means that all the brothel madams should be in jail. But, of course, they are never anywhere in the proximity no, of a jail. serve someone that there is a sex industry. I mean, absolutely. they don't really want to get rid of it. Yes, absolutely. No, I mean, it, it just keeps money bumping back and forth. Mm. You yes, know. yes, but unfortunately people like Leela... Well, Leela, you know, at the end of the book is in a very different place in some ways from where she is at the start. Um, I'm a bit afraid to ask, um, what happened to Leela? Um... I don't know if I should talk about it. Oh, no, maybe not. <laughs> no, maybe not. Well, speaking of questions, perhaps we'll ask the audience if they have any. Um, there's no roving microphone, so if anyone has a question, um, please put your hand up, ask the question, and then I will repeat it for the audience. Um, I see one. Uh, the anti-economic census vision, is this one that how the government ultimately justifies? Has there been any kind of rethinking of it since? I'll just repeat the question for the, sure. for the microphone. Uh, the, the, the comment and question was about um, the fact that when the, when the bar girls were thrown out of the bars and had to go into sex work, all the economic infrastructure that they had been uh, providing for their families fell apart and how much the, did the government understand what they were really doing when they brought that act in? One of the things I should actually mention with regard to, you know, bar dancers sending their children uh, or their siblings' children to school was that generally they'd send them to schools outside Bombay. They'd send them to boarding schools because although we think of Bombay as this sprawling metropolis of millions, it's actually a little village in so many ways, certainly for the community of bar dancers. And so everybody would know who was, you know, the bar dancer's child and would stigmatize them. So to protect them, they would send them to boarding schools and they would send them to really good boarding schools, you know, where, which were very expensive. And so, of course, immediately after the ban, these children were taken out. But um, no, actually, there hasn't been any rethink. The, um, uh, the decision was appealed in the High Court, and it was struck down. But then the state government appealed that decision to the Supreme Court. And since 2005, 2006, actually, it's been pending with the Supreme Court and there's been no decision. But really, even if the Supreme Court overturns the ban, uh, you know, finally, we're still going to have to start from scratch. It's going to be a whole new world. And it's not going to change the lives of the girls who've been affected because they've moved back, not to their villages, where they wouldn't be accepted at all, but to other states and, you know, there have been several suicides that have been documented since. So whatever happens, it's going to be completely different. Uh, another question? Um, yes. Hmm. I was surprised. Um, sorry, the, oh, question, I'm so sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. the question was about the reception of the book in India and whether it's easier for Sonia to, to observe from now that she lives outside India. I was surprised by how good the reception was because uh, we do have the sense, this sort of recently circulated notion that I don't even know if it has any root in reality that Indians get very offended when people point out that, you know, in many ways we're still a poor country with many significant problems. But um, I don't know if that's really true. I think people get offended when the stories aren't authentic. Um, and I, and I was, but I was really taken aback by how great the reception has been. I think it's, you know, what I try to show is this is, it's not about good or bad circumstances. This is about our life, and this is who we are. These are the things that we do to each other. Um, 
But I wrote this book and I researched it while I was in India. And so I was just doing some editing when I moved to the States. But I, I would be very upset, I think, if I moved back and found that I saw things through, you know, foreign eyes. Um, I keep going back often because I don't want to be in that situation. Just, to, just coming back to what we, we started off talking about, the fact that narrative nonfiction is not a hugely established genre in, in India. I think perhaps your, a book like yours stands out and gets such a great reception because people aren't familiar with seeing their community reflected back that way. I think so. Perhaps it's the beginning of a, of a renaissance of, of narrative nonfiction. That would be wonderful. That would be amazing because I just can't think of a better place to mine for you know great stories mm-hmm. and to try and sort of understand how our society is changing, you know? Um, Mm. How do we go from here? How do we... I'm always just really impressed by people who write the big India books because I know I'll never... I just don't comprehend India myself. very, very finely on one little thing. (laughs) You know, that's the only way to deal with Mm. just... Well, I've never been to India, and I have not read a lot of Indian literature, but this book made me feel like I actually knew something not about a very small part of it, but I knew a lot about it after I'd finished reading this book. Um, I've, I've had enough questions. Does someone else have a, another question for Sonia? What could be changed or should be changed in India in regarding the sex industry? Uh, with regard to the sex industry? Se- or the, bar- the Okay. Violence. Well, you know, um, definitely legalising sex work because... One of the things that I have noticed is that the sex workers are understandably terrified of the cops. So uh, now a cop will catch a sex worker who isn't even soliciting, um, and she's just in the market, she's with her kids, she might be buying vegetables, and he recognizes her from her beat, from his beat as a sex worker, and he grabs her by the scruff of her neck and threatens to throw her into jail unless she hands him a bribe. So that fear you know, leads to all sorts of financial transactions as well as sexual transactions. And cops do take their sex for free Mm -hmm. from sex workers. They do take money from them. But if one could take away that fear, if a sex worker could say, well, yeah, sure, take me to the magistrate, what is he going to say, you know? I mean, certainly, if there is systemic abuse and if one group of people is used to abusing another, they will always find ways to do it. Mm -hmm. They don't need the law on their side. Mm -hmm. But really... It would help so much. Although for, for that to happen, for sex work to be legalised in India, you'd have to overcome not just the traditions and not just the corruption, you know, the established corruption, but also the, the caste issues and the, and the gender issues. I mean, it would take an awful lot, wouldn't it, to, to get to that point? And yet things are changing very fast in India, I suppose. You know, I think we are obsessed with the idea of morality and the sense that we are all very moral, when, of course, in various degrees, we are all incredibly immoral. Mm -hmm. But uh, even with the dance bar issue, it was so ridiculous, and yet not even one politician from the opposition party would stand up for the bar dancers because nobody wanted to be associated with these dancing girls and somehow have their morality questioned. And so to imagine that somebody will actually stand up and say, well, no, you know... Sex workers have every right to pursue employment uh, and their profession as anybody else. Mm. Um, well, yes. Oh, look, in Australia, I mean, sex work is decriminalised in many states, and and there's been a lot of interest in the work, in the lives of sex workers and how it works and so on. But and, and yet, most of them, are, almost all women who work in that industry, keep it to themselves. It's a, they work anonymously. They mm. don't reveal um, the, the the kind of the inherited. Um, load of assumptions about sex workers is so such a, a weight that it's going to take a long time to evaporate. You know, slowly but surely, I think it will happen. Uh, but I can imagine in a place where um, women are already regarded as a kind of chattel in a family structure, it would be very difficult to, not impossible, obviously, but difficult to then cha- transform that um, con- concept in the light of an industry which is devoted to the sexual service of women. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, for a lot of men, they can have sexual access to their wives any time they want anyway, can't they? So um, I can imagine that there'd be a, it'd have to be a titanic shift, but I, I really hope that happens sometime. Um, I think we have time for just one more question. Has anyone got a question for Sonia? Um, I, look, I, I, there were so many things in this book that I wanted to touch on. Um, if I said to you, Leela is a victim, what would you say? If, as a, if I put the proposition to you that Leela is a victim, what would your response be? Well, I would say she was victimised, but I wouldn't agree that she was a victim because I, mm. I think she chose not to be. I think she still managed to 
keep the reins of her life in her hands. I don't even know how she did that. Because even one of the abuses that had been inflicted on her, if, if that had happened to me, I think I would have never recover. But she managed to. Um, and that was so astounding. The, it's wonderful. The last lines of, of the story, without giving anything away, uh, is you and Leela uh, talking alone. Um, I just read it. Leela patted her hair away from her face and flashed me a smile. What am I looking for? I asked. Fear, she said. Tell me, do you see it? I didn't have to think twice. No, I said, I don't think I ever have. She is a fearless character. Um, and this is a fearless book, which I can't recommend highly enough. It's extraordinary. Would you all please join me in thanking Sonia for joining us? Thank you.